phone rang, and I picked up as I sped onwards. Oh, uh, let me check. Yeah. I believe we've done this before. Okay, yeah, you're right. Oh, yeah, yeah. Once we made it past Shibuya Station, the roads were relatively clear. We ought to make it to the lab in no time. Phone ring again. It was Stan. What's going What's on? What's going on? Oh. Uh, oh, sorry. No, no, it was you. It was you. My apologies. No, no, it's you. It's you. It's you. Uh, what's going on? I asked the American. Listen carefully. Your life may depend on us. I'm going to ask you some questions. If the answer is yes, say that's right. If it's no, reply with will do. For a moment, I was bewildered. From the urgency of Stanley's voice, however, I realized that there was some kind of emergency. That's right, I said after a moment's thought. That ought to let Stanley know that he, I understood the code. Is Camp Kanon with you right now? That's right. That Kanon is an imposter. I gripped my phone more tightly, hoping it would stop the trembling in my hand. It's her, Stanley said. She's a fart. I had sti a stifled gasp of alarm. I don't have time to fill you in on the details, but I've got some pretty incontrovertible evidence. You need to turn back, now. I struggled to come to terms with what I'd just heard. I glanced at Kanan through the rearview mirror. She was holding Maria tightly in her arms. Was this really all an act on her part? And if so, why? There was only one possible reason. If Kanan was really Alfred, and she had only one goal. She was pretending to help Maria in order to get into the lab, where she would be able to steal the antivar. But wait, hold on. Kanan was Maria's friend, wasn't she? He told me had said as much herself. Tell me. Am I Hitomi again? Yes. Kanan is my sister's friend. Maria certainly knew what her own friend looked like. And since it was obvious that Maria might be in present, it didn't make sense for a clever imposter to pretend to be Kanan. Or did it? When Kanan showed up on the roof of South Hill, making her surprise attack on to top on me. Maria had taken off down the stairs without ever looking back. And when she turned up at the Endo Electronics workroom, Maria had already collapsed and fallen unconscious. I 
felt a chill spreading through my body. As far as I know, Rhea had never actually seen the girl who is now sitting in the back seat. But then, what about Hitomi? Shouldn't she have known what Kanan looked like? I tried to remember just what Hitomi had said. I just met her for the first time today. If they'd never met each other before today, then maybe Hitomi didn't know what the real Kanan looked like. That was the only explanation that made sense. Hey, Todd, are you still with me? Stanley sounded like he was on the verge of a panic. Hey, at any rate, you need to find a way to turn back without realizing what's going on. Even if Kanan was real, even if Kanan really was Alfred, I had to keep heading towards the lab. I went over the coded responses in my head. Yes was, that's right. No, was, will do. Will do, I said. Xavier Maria. Oh. Wait, Xavier Maria is your top priority, isn't it? That's right, I affirmed. All right then, guess I'll have to head that, head that way myself. In the meantime, do not let her get inside that lab. That's right. I hung up. Who was that? Kanan asked. I felt my heart skip a beat. That was Kuzde, that cop from earlier. I tried to keep my voice as level as possible. He was worried about us and wanted to check up. Ah, uh, okay. Ganon muttered, sounding disinterested. I could only hope she hadn't guessed the truth. It felt like the specter of death himself was breathing down my neck. At last, the minivan arrived at Ork Okoshi Pharmaceutical. I pulled up at the front gate and got out of the vehicle. Off to one side of the entrance was an intercom for contacting the security room. I'm assuming you've already heard the details from the director. I barked into the intercom. Open up. We haven't heard anything from Director Osawa. The security guard spat back. Moreover, the laboratory is currently on lockdown. I'm sorry, but not even Director Osawa is allowed inside. That's ridiculous. I scowled at the intercom in frustration. Then. A car came racing towards me along the street. The sound of screeching brakes filled the air as the vehicle skidded to a halt, and then Kenji Osawa jumped out from the driver's seat. Panda fill in for the time being. Maria! Osawa rushed over to me, then to Maria where she lay in the minivan. He looked carefully at his daughter's face. Thank goodness. Still hasn't gone symptomatic. Mr. Osawa, why aren't people being allowed into the laboratory? Osawa tilted his head. They're not? I explained what the guard had said. That's ridiculous. Osawa immediately called the security guard on the intercom. He got the same story. You've got to be kidding me! 
Osawa raged. I'm the lab director here! The security guard wasn't hearing it. I'm sorry, sir. These already came from Mr. Makino. No. So am I just supposed to sit out here and watch my daughter die? I racked my brain from other for other ideas. Maybe they'd have to climb the gates and break their way in. Then, over the intercom, we heard the sound of a phone ring in the security room. The security guard answered it without muting the intercom speaker. His voice was faintly audible. He sounded rather differential. Who in the world could he be talking to? Before I could amuse further, the gate suddenly opened. Huh? Why? Osawa and I looked at one another in surprise. I have a message for Director Osawa from Mr. Makino. The security guard said. From Makino? Osawa huddled over to the intercom and a brief sotto voce exchange with the guard. What was that all about? I asked. It, uh, would seem that my wife was able to pull some strings for us. Osawa smiled uncomfortably. I didn't have time to wonder what that might mean. Has that lock been opened for us as well? I asked. The smile disappeared from Osawa's face. No. She wasn't able to do anything about the final layer of security. I see. Well, let's regroup inside for now. Very well. Osawa said. By the way, who's supposed to, who's going to be hacking the password? I am. Kanan replied. Ah, so you're Kanan. We should get you to the laboratory then. Osawa began to lead the way inside. Kanan followed. If Kanan really was Alfred, I couldn't let her into the lab. But without getting the lock open, there was no way of getting Maria the antiviral she needed to survive. What was the right call? Should I still pretend to be in the dark and let Kanan try to hack the password? Eh? I was going to have to let her into the lab. I had made up my mind. Is something the matter? Osawa asked wearily. No. No, it's nothing. And if you would be so kind. Osawa led the way. Kanan and I followed him towards the storage facility. about 20 seconds for the elevator to reach the first basement level. The biohazard storage area was evidently fairly deep underground. The doors opened to reveal a long, straight corridor. There was a door at the far end, with a device at one side for checking IDs. Kanan approached the device, setting the laptop she'd borrowed from the security room on the floor in front of it. She fixed a scrap of paper with Kenji Osawa's password written on it to one side of the monitor. Then she connected a series of cables to both the laptop and the device. I kept my hand on my holster as I watched her work. 
Pinon began to slowly tap away at the keyboard. Her screen displayed a series of numeric values that changed with each keystroke. She checked the changes carefully, timing the movements of her fingers according to some formula. The device let out a warning sign, and display lit up. Incorrect password. The input had been rejected. Was this really going to work? I felt my impatience growing. Osawa's face showed a similar unease. Kanon turned to look at them, at us. How many failed attempts are we allowed? Two, I believe. Osawa answered. After a third failed attempt, the storage area is locked down and can't be reopened without input from the full board of directors. Granada had already resumed typing before he finished speaking. Uh, is that also me? There's a very slight difference in power and con in power consumption from the device when it processes a correct password compared to an incorrect one. There's a minuscule difference in the time it takes to run the process as well. If I can analyze those and compare them... Inan's voice trailed off. She continued working. There was another warning sound. A second failed attempt. A single bead of sweat ran down my forehead. But Kanan didn't so much as bat an eyelash. I see. Her face remained full of confidence. It won't be a problem. She assured us. This isn't my first time with this type of mechanism. Lowly, one at a time, Kanon pressed key after key while keeping her eyes on the laptop screen. With each keystroke, a waveform at the top of the screen, looking almost like an ec echocardiogram readout, wobbled slightly. The laptop let out a tiny sound. A sequence of ten characters appeared on the screen, and Kanan read them off. I jotted them down in my notebook then headed over to the scanner to enter the twin passwords for Osawa and Tanaka. The door opened. Kadan let out a sigh of relief. Osawa gathered up Maria and headed into the storage area. Get out. As soon as Osawa and his daughter were out of view, I drew my pistol. Kanon arched her eyebrow. What do you think you're doing? Just get out of here. I pointed the barrel of my gun at Kanon's face. Silently, she did as she was told, turning and walking towards the elevator. I followed a few paces behind. She gave no hint of resistance. Now I needed to let Stanley know that they'd successfully opened the laboratory door. I pulled out my cell phone, and I followed her into the elevator. As soon as I did, Kanan pressed herself flush against the wall. A sudden explosion from within the corridor sent me careening off balance. I slammed into the elevator wall. Then, as I lay in a daze, the elevator doors drew slowly closed, and the cab began to rise upwards. I could tell that the impact had broken several of my ribs. Blood rose up from my throat and filled the inside of my mouth. I felt my grip on consciousness fading, but I managed to flip open my cell phone. Stanley. Please, pick up. I jabbed my thumb hard on the call button. 
Stanley here. What's going on? Hey, has something happened? Hey, answer me! But it was too late for I, for even to hear, for me to even hear Stanley's voice. couldn't go anywhere until Stanley got here. I knew exactly what I needed to do. What's the matter? Osawa well, so turned and cast a look of confusion back at me and Kanan, both of whom had stopped in our tracks. We'll wait out here, I said. I mean, isn't Kanan gonna hack the password? There's been a slight change of plans. Go ahead and wait for us at the lab, Director. I... alright. But well, we don't have much time before Maria to develop symptoms. I'll be inside. Please don't keep me waiting too long. With Maria in his arms and a worried look on his face, Osawa hurried through the gates and disappeared from view. What do you think you're doing? Kanan asked, stiffening as I nudged the barrel of my gun against her spine. You're Alfred, aren't you? I have no idea what you're talking about. It's no use trying to play dull. Stanley found the proof. Before I finished speaking, Kanan seemed to disappear from view. She cartwheeled away at blinding speed, too quick for me to keep a bead on her. By the time she'd righted herself, she'd already drawn a gun of her own. Abruptly, I found myself facing her in a stare down, weapons aimed at one another. Then Kanan's phone rang, and she reached to answer it. Don't move, I roared. Did you forget the plan? That might be Hitomi calling. I don't care. Don't. You. Move. If Kanan really was Alfred, the whole plan might be a sham. I kept the barrel of my gun squarely on its mark. Kanan let out a little sigh. Have you considered that Stanley might be lying to you? Yes, it's possible. But I need to make sure we avoid a worst-case scenario. If you don't let me into the lab, who's going to hack the password? We've got your little decoy. My friends will get the fake Alfred to cough up the password. Once her phone had stopped ringing, Kanan sighed again. And what about Stanley, then? Is he on his way here? Who knows, I said. That could not lower her gun. She seemed disturbingly full of confidence. Could not flipped open her cell phone. Who do you think you're calling? I adjusted my aim pointing my gun at the young woman's head. Look, I'm going to call Hitomi and have her clear up these suspicions you have about me. We don't have time for this right now. Wouldn't you agree? 
not stared back at me, cell phone in hand, waiting for my reply. Hey. It doesn't matter what Hitomi says. I trust my own judgment. Your own judgment, huh? And is that always correct? Kanan began punching in numbers. She never took her eyes off of me as she waited for Hitomi to pick up. She's not answering. Kanan hung up and tried calling again. It's me. It looked like she'd gotten through this time. That detective doesn't trust me. Apparently he thinks I'm Alfred, not Kanan. After a few moments, Kanan held the phone out to me. Here. Hitomi says I'm definitely Kanan. I didn't reach out for the phone. Instead, I advanced on Kanan with my gun still on its mark. This is a farce, I spat. Hitomi's words don't mean a thing. You might be Kanan to her, but you aren't to me. I don't even know if there we ever was a real person named Kanan in the first place. So maybe you're Kanan. And you're Alfred. Kanan shook her head, then put her phone away. If you're really Alfred, then you don't actually need to hack the password, I said. I'm guessing you've already gotten it from Tanaka which means you'll be able to get your hands on the antiviral as soon as you get into the lab. Kanan didn't so much as flinch. The only thing stopping you is the antiviral still in Hitomi Osawa's body. Possessing the antiviral and having a monopoly on it are two very different things. You want to eliminate Hitomi. That's why you lured her down to the scramble. Am I wrong? If that's true, then how am I planning on getting rid of her? Using this so-called substitute Alfred or something? Yeah, that's right. I couldn't be certain. But I couldn't think of any other way. Kanan let out a laugh. <laughs> you don't know the first thing about Alfred. She said. Alfred keeps the outlines of his plans blurred so that his deliberate actions just get lumped in with the coincidences. That's the crux of all his plans. That's how he's able to pull off his schemes by himself. He'd never solicit help from a third party. Words seemed like they were Kanans, but also seemed like they were Alfred's. Whatever the case, I had to let Kano know that it told me was in danger. With my gun still at the ready, I got out of my phone and called the detective. phone rang several times and nobody answered. Eventually, I had no choice but to hang up. They must have been in the middle of a confrontation on the other end. 
For now, I could only pray that Kano and the others would be able to handle whatever threat they were up against. I am not letting you in there. At that, Kanan let out a faint chuckle. <laughs> in that case, I'm going to have to eliminate you. Even without her gun raised, she still radiated intimidation. I might have had her at gunpoint, but I could feel the threat of her presence like a gathering storm. Eliminate me, I said, doing my best to mask any sign of weakness. You're the one who doesn't have your gun ready. I don't need my gun. Gnaught said simply. And why is that? Because you can't shoot me. What's that supposed to mean? Kanon glared sharply at me. Her look pierced me like a blade. Then she quirked an unsettling smile and took a step closer to me. Don't move, I warned. Hey. Try anything funny, and I'll make sure you regret it. I kept my gun trained on the center of her chest. You can't shoot me. Kadan took another step closer. You're still traumatized from that time you let your friend's wife die. that. I was shaken now. My aim wavered. I heard you talking with the younger detective up on that rooftop. That was right. She had been there. Let's test my theory out. Ganon pointed her index finger at her own heart. If you think I'm Alfred, then shoot me. Right here. Oh. The corner of her mouth twisted up. You can't do it, can you? My gun hand shook all the more. You're afraid to pull the trigger. as if her words were a spell she that she was casting over me. You can hardly even stand the thought of pointing your gun at someone. I shook my head violently back and forth, but I couldn't get Kanan's words out of my head. Stand comes down to it, just shoot her. If you hesitate for a moment, she'll have you dead. That's what Stanley had said. And he was right. Don't hesitate. Think. This was Alfred. A sadistic terrorist. I just needed to trust myself and pull the trigger. Pull it! It was a horrid, visceral sound. Gastric fluids rushed up my throat. I pitched forward onto my hands and knees and vomited on the spot. The sensation of pulling the trigger. The recoil in the wake of the shot. It was exactly as it had been all those years ago. I never wanted to fire a gun again. At this point, I'd probably never be able to. Come on. 
Where were you even aiming? The voice had come from right in front of me. I looked up to see Kanan standing right there. My heart began hammering like mad. This was the end. I braced myself for oblivion, even as my body cried out to survive. There was the dull roar of a gunshot, and then silence. Stop. This is the sort of nonsense we don't have time for right now. Anant shook her head, then put her phone away. If you're really Alfred, then you don't actually need to act the password, I said. This is just a bluff. He knows he can't get away. His only chance... His only chance would be to try to spread the virus around and take off while everyone was distracted. Which meant they needed to just grab the guy and be done with it. Enough of the high and mighty act. Susumi shouted. Evidently, he shared my opinion. He began to stomp toward Alfard. But he didn't reach him in time. The vials in Alfred's hand went sailing high into the air. Look out! Catch him all! Catch him! I gestured for my comrades to fan out across the open space. The vial seemed to almost vanish against the backdrop of the eating sky. How many of them had this guy even thrown? There was no way to tell for sure. And even if one of them broke, it would, it would be the death sentence for Shibuya. They had to make sure they caught them all. Spitting around the midst of chaos, I saw Susumu catch one vile death ring. Any of the other gang members appeared to have done the same. There's one more! Over there! Desperate shout. The desperate shout came from the tone. She spotted one she spotted the vial sailing high in a high arc away from the SOS members. Damn it! I launched into motion, ignoring the searing pain in my leg. But the but the falling vial was, was so far away. <laughs> it was now or never. I threw myself into the head into a head first hurry. Nice catch! The gang members broke out into a cheering applause and blood. I got back onto my feet and looked around, but no sign of either Kano or Alphard. I think that's him. Kind of. Yachi. If you're looking for the detective. Susumu gestured with his chin. I looked, I looked and saw Kano far away across the scramble, chasing after Alphard. Soon, both men were lost within the crowd. 
I would have charged. I would have charged off in pursuit as well, but my wounded leg made me made that impossible. Get him, the tank. I murmured under my breath, counting on me. State of high alert, and people on the street were running around uneasily, unsure just what was going on. The main roads had been blocked off, and, all, and automobiles and motorcycles were at a standstill. Some vehicles had overturned on the curb in an apparent attempt to circumvent the boat. But didn't we already do this part? Okay. Do we? I can't remember. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah. As I drove along, I, w I again tried to deduce Alford's plan of action. If Alford herself was on the way to Loud now, then what was the objective of the fake who'd been sent to the scramble? To act as a decoy. To act as a decoy. Surely that was an imposter's purpose. But it wouldn't be a simple matter of providing a brief distraction. Alford had been careful to wipe out almost everyone she'd associated with in the past. That was precisely why all of her defined characteristic, characteristics, such as age and sex and nationality, had been unknown. It was unthinkable that she'd allowed his decoy, who almost certainly knew who she really was, to stay alive. And since he told me carried the end of our own body, Alford likely wanted to get rid of her as well. In all likelihood, the terrorist mastermind was planning to steal the anterior barrel from the lab. But as long as some of it remained in Tommy's bloodstream, she wouldn't have a monopoly on it. Aha! I suddenly blurted out loud. I just realized what Alfred hoped to accomplish at the scramble. She meant to eliminate both Tommy and her own decoy at the same time. The question was how. Beginning with her bombings in Chicago, Alford had made frequent use of remote-controlled explosives. It was likely that she'd opt for something similar here as well. But she wasn't going to be at the scramble herself. So how in the world was she going to trigger the explosion? Was there some clue to be found in something she said or done earlier? Something. Everyone in the scramble was going, probably going to die. Then, as I de desperately racked my brain, I remember something Kano said. It had been a while that we were at the scene of the minivan explosion or together. He said he heard he heard a cell phone ringtone at the time of the explosion. Not sure if that's significant though. 
I recall the recent exchange between Alphard and Tomi. Two had called each other's cell phones. Alphard hadn't really been checking to make sure to make sure she had the right number. She'd been checking to make sure Tomi hadn't changed her ringtone. That was it. The bomb was set to dead in response to a specific piece of music. And the ringtone on Tomi's phone was the trigger. Or could the bomb be hidden then? I didn't have the time to think. I needed to alert Kano and others right away. As I pulled out my phone gun, I recalled the map of the stakeout positions. Kano would probably be, be, be right next to the decoy alpha for it. It might be a mistake to call him under circumstances. Maybe I couldn't risk calling Kano, but I could call Achi. I dialed at on the Achi Endo's number. Please don't let me be too late. I muttered to myself as I waited for the call to connect. Achi was quick to pick up. Mr. Stanley? What's going on? Eventually, I spotted Kano on the far edge of the crowd. The detective pumped his fist in victory. It looked like he got it looked like he got an Alfred to cough up the password. Thank goodness! Finally, some really good news. Now, the Tommy and Muriel were both safe. A surge of relief ran through my body. Unexpectedly, my cell phone rang. It was Stanley. Mr. Stanley? What's going on? Please don't let me be too late. I muttered to myself as I oh. How did the negotiations go? The detective. Oh. The detective caught Alfred. Aji replied happily. He got him to give up the password, and I think his folk. And I think he's called his folks at the lab. Does that mean the case is closed then? No, not yet. Right now, I need you to do exactly as I tell you. There was a pause before Aji responded. Why? What's going on? If you want to save Tomi, then shut up and listen. I snapped. <clears throat> All right. Tell me what I need to do. First, you need to power down Tommy's cell phone. Turn off her cell phone? For what? I'm pretty sure there's a bomb somewhere near your location. I tried to keep my voice as calm and steady as possible. A, a bomb? Archie's voice squeaked into falsetto. The guy that Kano just apprehended is a decoy. The real Alphard is planning to eliminate Tomi and the false Alphard at the same time. I didn't have the time to explain that Kanon was Alphard. Besides, it would only confuse the matter all the more at this point. Listen, first, turn off that cell phone. 
Then, go and look for the bomb. Okay, got it. Aji hung up. Hopefully the team at the scramble would be able to pull through. Now, I needed to focus on capturing Alphard. I tightened my grip on the steering wheel. My emotions were coming on far too strongly for me to keep them in check. In the back of my mind, I thought about the last I'd ever seen Frank. A friend. There had been nothing left of my brother but a bloodied hand left for reaching out from beneath the rubble. Ever since that day, since that very moment, I had sworn vengeance upon Alphard. I would never forget the rage I felt at having those left my family taken from me. Hey Jack, once it's all tidy up, I'm gonna need a drink. Let's you and me have a beer together. Sure. You got it. Spring into action, leading away the throng of panicking civilians. But all the while, I couldn't help but worry about Frank. We've got almost 30 minutes left. He'll be fine. That group will definitely be here in time. I, mean, I did my utmost to reassure myself, but still without smog. When the bomb squad descended upon the area, clad in every deep protective gear, I shot a look at my watch. I felt a surge of relief. Only about 15 minutes had passed. There was still plenty of time for them to do the idea of the bomb with their nickel nitrogen. Thank God. Drinks will be alright. But I got no chance to wish I thought. There was an ear splitting boom as a powerful shockwave shook the area. I rode back around, staring in horror at the place that my brother had been. Nothing remained but a mound of rubble. A later investigation revealed that time on the bottom stereo had been near rose. The explosive had never linked to a timer at all. Instead, it had been deadly via remote control. Using an invisible timer will allow us to do a false sense of security. I had meant to save many lives that day, to be sure. But it had come at the cost of my own brother's life. Had I really made the best decisions I could have made? I was still asking myself the same question over and over, even now. But no matter how much I blame myself, it wouldn't bring Frank back. If there was one thing I could still do for my brother, it was getting revenge on Alphard with my own hands. I had been in a constant pursuit of Alphard ever since. I would stoop to any level for information, without remorse. My opponent was someone who would do anything, anything at all, to achieve a goal. It only made sense for me to do the same. At some point, I'd stopped even hesitating to get my own hands dirty. I would charge headlong into any danger if I sensed off for its presence. Even my own life was a price I was willing to pay in the name of that vengeance. I could never hope to latch my jaws into my cold throat if I behaved like prey to myself. I must be the greatest predator. Aside my humanity, I would become a bloodstained beast that improved my chances at the hunt. But the hunt was all that mattered. The pursuit of Alphard had become my only purpose. So it had been the past two years. So it, so it had been for the past two years. Now those years flashed through my mind in the blink of an eye. 
As I came back into the moment, I marveled at my own ferocity and at the depth of the wound I'd suffered. Hey. The rest of me hurts me. for the life she to herself and to There could be no institution of first death of her as long as she was still alive. The law wasn't going to punish out for it. I was. I didn't care if anyone thought it was a, pe a petty vanilla. Only someone who'd suffered the loss of a loved one at the hands of a vicious killer could understand my seething resentment. Koshi Pharmaceutical Lab finally came into view. A large pillow of black smoke was rising from one of the building's windows. I felt the chill on the pit of my stomach. I hopped out of the car and then gasped. Tatano. The detective was sprawled face down the ground outside the laboratory gate, his gun still in his hand. Blood had poured around his head. He'd been shot at close range. Death would have been instantaneous. All too late, I felt the full weight of my mistake. Tatano had gone up against a point who was out of his league and got himself killed. And I had put him up to it. I would never have let Tottenham know try to handle the situation on, on his own. He should have done, I should have done whatever it took to stop the detective. There must have been some way I could have averted this disaster. Saving Maria is your top priority, isn't it? That's right. There had been no hesitation in Tottenham's word. I had known how badly the man wanted to save Maria. That's why I deferred to the detective's judgment. judgment. Now I was faced with the results of my own naivete. The smoke pouring from the building showed no signs of diminishing. In all likelihood, the lab had been destroyed with the bomb. How far its plan had run its course before him. I had even got there. I couldn't forgive myself for having been so thoroughly outwitted. Nor would I ever forgive how far for the terrorists had done. Anger erupted inside of me, raging like hellfire, driving me onto action. Death would be too kind of fate for Alfred. Now more than ever before the thirst for vengeance consumed me. But even as I began to stalk towards the laboratory, a bullet struck me in the cross caught me in the crossfire and the abdomen. For a moment, I couldn't process what had happened. There was an intense, searing pain that sw sped through my gut. Warm liquid began to soak through my shirt. Then a figure emerged from, from within the smoke. I've been waiting for you to show up, Jack. Another bullet tore through my body. Time seemed to slow for me. I watched the spray of blood scattering like a crimson mist. Alfart! I hissed the word through clenched teeth. Out of pure stubborn spite, I managed to stay on my feet, tottering towards my foe. I raised my gun. I couldn't. I didn't stop pulling the trigger until the very moment my world went dark.
without my cell phone, I dialed up Asawa. As I did, I recall his my last exchange with Stanley at the electronics shop. Looks like we'll be able to add that beer together after all. The phone rang several times before Asawa picked up. It's Kano. I had the password. Uh, are you serious? I saw her bloated in shock. Here, let me give it to you. Are you ready? Yes. 59FBAI4QL1. As I passed along an alphanumeric sequence, I kept my eye on Palmer. The man stared back at me. An expression of bitter defeat. There's a long silence on the other end of the phone. At last, I saw his excited voice came through. It did it! It opened! The lock opened! A little deep breath of utter relief. Uh, you know what? Emilio fill in. <laughs> Palmer snorted. You're really satisfied with catching me and saving the life of one girl? I suppose it's the Japanese way to forget the pain that's been visited upon you. But it's not over. The bloodshed will continue. All over the world. Women. Children. Yelled at me. Innocence. All will bleed. Because absolute justice is on our side. Is that right? I drove my fist into Palmer's face. There's no such thing as absolute justice. It's like that kind of blind faith that kept the world in conflict. Well, that sure is quite the mess. Rolling around in surprise, I saw Kuze standing there. Director Kuze! I bowed my head apologetically. I may have apprehended a criminal mastermind, but only because I ignored a direct order to place Maria under quarantine. I'm sorry, sir, but I. Save that party. Kuze interrupted. You're the one who solved the case. You did good, kid. Once again, I bowed, this time even more deeply. Oh, and one more thing, Kano. Yes, sir? Sasayama has regained consciousness. I thought you'd like to know. Sasayama? They were able to save him? I got a call from the hospital. Looks like he's going to pull through. That's great! Really great news. Tears of relief came to my eyes. And if Saw was able to get the lock at the lab open, she'd also been able to get Maria the antivirus without any further difficulty. I dragged Palmer to his feet, then did a handcuff from his own wrist, using it to properly bind his cap my captive. The metal ring snapped shut with a soft Satisfying kick click. Palmer simply hung his head. It was over. It was all finally over. It would have been quite a day, I reflected. Beyond the challenges I have faced, I come face to face with my own shortcomings. Now I know a long way I had to go to become the man I wanted to be. But at least I learned what it truly meant to be a detective. Kuze was muttering to himself nearby. I mean, don't even look alike, but... The director shook his head, cleared his throat. You know, Kano, for a second there, you look ju just like Takano. Really, sir? I smiled, fussing sheepishly, sheepishly with his hair, my hair. 
Pizza's words were the finest praise I could have asked for. Someday, I hoped I really might be a detective like Tato. No, I decided I would be. Until then, I'd never give up on that dream. It might be a long, long road, but I would walk it. I looked up into the sky. The neon lights of the city shone from all over. This was the same old Shibuya that it always was, the one that I looked at now with new eyes. Stop. This is the sort of nonsense we don't have time for right now. Kanan shook her head, then put her phone away. If you're really Alfred, then you don't actually need to hack the password, I said. I'm guessing you've already gotten it from Tanaka. Which means you'll be able to get your hands on the antiviral as soon as you get into the lab. Ganon didn't so much as flinch. The only thing stopping you is the antiviral still in Hitomi Osawa's body. Possessing the antiviral and having a monopoly on it are two very different things. You want to eliminate Hitomi. That's why you lured her down to the scramble. Am I wrong? If that's true, then how am I planning on getting rid of her? Using this so-called substitute Alfred or something? Yes, that's right. I couldn't be certain. But I couldn't think of anything any other way. Cannot let out a laugh. <laughs> you don't know the first thing about Alfred. She said. Alfred keeps the outlines of his plans blurred, so that his deliberate actions just get lumped in with the coincidences. That's the crux of all his plans. That's how he's able to pull off his schemes by himself. He'd never solicit help from a third party. Wait, I think we did this. We did. <laughs> <laughs> That's correct. Yet be. Detect the Tatsuna was this is, this is new. Okay, yeah. This is new. <laughs> Indeed. With my gun still at the ready, I got out my phone and called Kano. The young detective was quick to pick up. Detect the Tatsuna? What's going on? You need to get to Hitomi Osawa to safely immediately. Alfred isn't trying to get at her blood. He wants her eliminated. What? Hurry. Uh, yes, sir. Once I'd gotten Kano's confirmation, I hung up. And now your little plan has been foiled, I said. Kanan snorted. <sighs> Has it now? If I really am Alfred, then all I need to do is eliminate you here and head right on into that lab. 
Even without her gun raised, she still radiated intimidation. I might have had her at gunpoint, but I could feel the threat of her presence like a gathering storm. Eliminate me, I said, doing my best to mask any sign of weakness. You're the one who doesn't have your gun ready. I don't need my gun. Anon said simply. And why is that? All right. Try anything funny, and I'll make you. Sh I'll make sure you regret it. I kept my gun trained on the center of her chest. The cell phone rang. Tatano's name appeared on an incoming call display. I quickly picked up. Detective Tatano? What's going on? You need to get it to Itomi Usawa to safety immediately. Alfred isn't trying to get at her blood. He wants her eliminated. What? Tatsuno wasn't making any sense. Alfard, Palmer, had already been arrested. I thought it was over now. Hurry. Tatsuno barked. Uh, yes, sir. Detective! Archie called out suddenly. He was staring at Hitomi and the others in a statue Hachiko. Detective! That's not the real Alphard! He's a fake! A fake? Yeah, I just got a call from Stanley. I didn't want to believe it. If this Alphard was just a decoy, it meant the real culprit was elsewhere, still on the loose. Hachi's voice rang with desperation. He said the real Alphard is planning to give it of both Hitomi and the fake with some kind of bomb. To get rid of Hitomi? That line of with what Tatsuno just called to warn me about. It must be true then. Once again, I tensed. A bomb, but where? 
Get the explosive ordnance division. Wait, someone. Uh, Jules, go ahead. Get me the explosive ordnance division. Someone squawked. We got an emergency here. Oh, it was Kuze, practically screaming into his cell phone. Kuze. We're at the tram outside the station. Hurry! Director started running towards the precinct, still shouting as he wove his way through the crowd. I felt myself starting to panic. If Atomi and Palmer were the targets, the bomb had to be nearby. I stormed over to my captive. Okay, where's the bomb? I demanded. What are you talking about? Don't play dumb with me! I already told you the password, Palmer said. What point would there be in keeping things from you now? He had a point. And if he had known about the existence of the bomb, he would have kept that a secret so far. Getting him to reveal it now would not be easy. I decided just to have to go look for it myself. I took a deep breath. I tried to think logically. If I were Alfred, what would I, what would I do? I couldn't ensure that I would eliminate both Hitomi and the fake Alfard at the same time. Why would I plant a bomb in order to put it off? On a fake. There's no other place he could possibly plant planted it. I began to pat Palmer down carefully. Achi! I shouted. Check the case! Hurry! I gestured to the Tachi case Palmer had been carrying. Don't move. I searched through his captives, to my captive's jacket, in the pockets of his pants. I I came with nothing. Perhaps Alfred fit the bomb into the man's watch or belt? Stop this. I'm not carrying a bomb. Shut your mouth! I couldn't spot anything suspicious about the watch or the belt, either. I clenched my jaw in frustration. Did Palm really not have it up after all? Detective! It was Archie. He looked alarmed. I hurry over to him, dragging Palmer along. When I look inside the Atachi case, Palmer's face went pale. No. It can't be. Alfred. Why? His voice was hoarse with betrayal. Then he abruptly broke into stilted laughter. <laughs> Trusting someone really does make you blind. <laughs> Such a simple, childish ruse. And it went right under my nose. Palmer looked over at me. We need to get out of here immediately, he said. That right there is C4, a high-yield plastic explosive used by the military. And that's enough to blow this whole area to smithereens. A cheer ran up my spine. Don't let this man go, I said, handing Palma over to Suzumu. Got it, just leave it to us. Suzumu signaled to his followers. He merely dumped Palmer unceremoniously on the ground. Carefully inspected inside the Tachi case. Achi had found a false bottom in the case. The space beneath it was indeed packed full of plastic explosives. Set within it was what looked like a detonator. 
I didn't know much about much about bomb disposal. Would have been taught the very basics during my police academy training. Nonetheless, something drew my eye. A microphone. There's a parabolic microphone attached to the detonator. In all likelihood, the detonator had been set to go off in response to some sort of sound. Hey, detective. Uh, it, is this thing gonna explode or not? Achi's voice was shaky. It looks like it's sound activated, but it hasn't gone off just from having people talking nearby. That means it must be set to explode in response to a specific sound trigger. Specific sound, huh? Achi took a moment to think. That's it! It must be Hitomi's ringtone! That's why Stan we had me power her phone down. So that means we're safe then? Hitomi asked. It's not going to explode anymore, right? I had to fight back any feelings of relief. We couldn't forget that this was Alphard we were dealing with. Assuming we were safe would be a dangerous mistake. Carefully lifting up the detonator, I spotted another cable disconnected to the bomb. As calmly as I could, I tried to remove the plastic explosive from the Tachi case. I quickly discovered that a thinly stretched sheet of plastic explosive was only an intermediate layer, concealing a second false bottom. A small timer had been set beneath it. There's not just a sound trigger. My mouth had gone dry. My voice came out as a whisper. The bottom has also been fitted with a countdown timer. Stanley had been right in the mark. The ringtone had told me cell phone would trigger the explosion. That way, Alfred could eliminate both her and his stooge, Palmer, at the same time. But just in case the sound trigger were discovered, as a backup, the bomb had also been rigged to explode at a set time. I speed dialed my boss. Director Kuze! Where's that bomb squad? 0151. 0150. Not even two minutes left to go. Didn't look like an explosive ordnance unit would make it in time. I scanned the area, weighing my options. I noticed Archie standing right beside the bomb case. Archie! I called out, Leave that thing and get out of here! But Archie didn't move. No way. He sat down. The Tachi, the Tachi case cradled in his arms. Archie, what the hell are you doing? I'm not going anywhere until everyone's made it safe to safety. Detective, you need to get you need to get these people someplace safe right away. Clear the area first, then I'll go. There's no way I can do that. Damn it! Don't you want to save these people too? I bit my lower lip in frustration. Achi was right. If the bomb went off amidst a crowd like this, there was no telling how many casualties there would be. I needed to do whatever I could as quickly as possible. Get back, everybody! Get back, everybody! Get back! Achi shouted at the top of his lungs. There's a bomb! Everyone, get out of here! Just run! Following his lead, I started directing nearby civilians to safety. Tell me, Caesar, and others added their own voices. Caesar, it's a bomb! Everyone, run! Tell me. Get away as fast as you can! The crowd wasn't listening to their warnings. On the contrary, some people hurried closer to see what the commotion was all about. It's no use. We were out of time. I had to save Achi at least. I turned back to him and called out. Achi, that's enough! Lead the bomb, let's go! 
Kenichi! Hitomi shouted. Come on! But Achi only clutched the bomb more tightly. What are you doing? I screamed. Come with us! Hurry! Still, Achi would not move. His face went pale. Wait, Achi, your leg! What about my leg? Earlier, when you kicked that steel pipe! What the heck? Finally, I understood. It wasn't that Archie didn't want to move. He couldn't move. And so he decided to get all heroic and use himself as a human shield to minimize the impact explosion on everybody else. That idiot! I muttered. His leg was busted. Why did he say so? How did he even make it this far? There could be much time left. If I rushed to help him now, I might not make it to safety before the bomb went off. I had to make a decision. I couldn't just rush in without a plan. I detected me both a cool mind and a fiery spirit. And what he did the situation was, the more he needed to stay cool. The feet of muscles in my legs began to stiffen. I did my best to slow his my racing heartbeat as my mind sought desperately for a way out of the situation. But my eyes remained fixed on Archie, holding that bomb in his arms. Knowing that it could explode at any moment made it almost impossible to think. The harder I tried to calm myself, the more my panic grew. I cursed myself for not leaping into action immediately. I should have acted before thinking. That was the only thing I was good at. Still, I stood frozen, staring at Archie. Then I felt the hairs rise out on the back of my neck. White smoke is pouring from the approaching new minivan. The vehicle teetered to a stop along the shoulder of the road. Still, the smoke spilled out, rolling from a partly open window. I could feel a strange chill in the air. Is that? Instinctively, I rushed towards it. Peering through the minivan's windows, I saw a clunky box shaped device in the back. It was rolling fiercely, spinning out. Unending mountain of white clumps. A dry ice machine. Hey! I yelled, banging hard on the door. Open up! By freezing a bomb that used an electronic activation trigger, it was possible to kill the battery cell and deactivate the detonator. The explosive ordnance unit used liquid nitrogen, but maybe dry ice could work as well. There were three men inside the vehicle. I shouted the one in the driver's seat. I need to borrow that machine! Uh, Justin tries to a voice. What voice? Stoner's voice. Stoner. Huh? The man replied in a lethargic drawl. No way, man. We haven't even paid the thing off yet, man. It's no time to explain or negotiate. I was just going to have to take it by force. Emilio. Hold it right there! Another man appeared suddenly in front of the vehicle. The pushy fellow I had run into at the scene of the explosion. You guys are with that Wandering Angels theater troupe, yeah? He said the van's occupants. Put in a dry ice machine. That thing's defective. The guy from the electronics store said he'd refund your deposit. Huh? For, for real? Yeah. He told me to tell you that the machine has been recalled. We'll bring it back for you, so hurry up and open the door. Uh, yeah, okay. Damn, dude. The newcomer helped three men unload a dry ice machine from a minivan. Then he turned to me. Here. Hurry up and take it. He shouted. Right, thanks. 
I wasn't sure what was going on, but I took the machine and ran, pushing ahead of him, pu pushing ahead of me, across the pavement. Archie! The Tommy wailed, tears in her eyes. Detective blew right past her, trailing a blowing, billowing plume of white smoke in my wake. Please let me make it in time. Please let me make it in time. Please let me make it in time. That loose a wild yell. I ran as fast as my legs would take me towards Achi and a bomb. Unexpectedly, my cell phone rang. It was Stanley. Mr. Stanley, what's going on? How did negotiations go? I quickly filled him in on the good news. The detective caught Alfred! He got him to give out the password and I think he called his folks at the lab. Does that mean the case is closed then? No, not yet. Right now, I need you to do exactly as I tell you. For a moment, my, my head swam. Is this isn't over yet? Why? What's going on? If you want to save a Tommy, then shut up and listen! Stanley barked. Alright. Tell me what I need to do. First, you need to power down a Tommy's cell phone. Turn off her phone? What, what for? Was Stanley serious or was he messing with me? Pretty sure that there's a bomb somewhere near your location. A bomb? My voice squeaked into a falsetto. The guy that uh, uh, Kano just apprehended is his decoy. The real Alpha is planned to eliminate Tommy and the false Alpha at the same time. They both had Tommy and his own decoy? What did he do that? And the guy we just captured was a fake, then who was the real Alfred? I couldn't wrap my head around it. The more I tried, the more my thoughts became just a jumbled mess. Listen, first turn off that cell phone. Then go and look for the bomb. <sighs> okay, got it. Right now, I just needed to do what Stanley told me to do. I didn't have the time to make sense of the situation. Hanging up, I called out to Hitomi. Hitomi, you need to have you. You have to turn off your cell phone. She stared back at me, too confused to act. Look, just hurry up and do it. Right, okay. Pulling her phone from her pocket, she switched. She switched the power off. Then I turned to Kano's direction. Detective! I shouted. Kano was looking toward, toward me, seemingly already aware of something was amiss. Detective! That's not the real Alpha! He's a fake! A fake? Kano looked understandably shocked. 
Yeah, I just got a call from Stanley. He said the real outfit is planning to get rid of both Hitomi and the fake with some kind of bomb. Kano hurriedly turned back to the fake Alfred and, and began a fresh barrage of questions. Meanwhile, my mind was racing again. If the bomb was meant to wipe out both Hitomi and the imposter, it would have had to been pretty powerful. Though, it couldn't be anything particularly small. Where could the bomb be hidden then? I scanned the area, but didn't spot any place that seemed plausible. In my eyes, had a light on the Atache case Ikoi had discarded. Could it be? No sooner had my suspicions been aroused than, than I heard Kano call out to me. Achi, check the case! Hurry! I heard we opened the Atache case and searched the interior. But the only things were pieces of medical equipment, tubes and syringes and the like. There was nothing that looked remotely like a bomb. Still, where else could this bomb possibly be hidden? Damn it! I had to find the explosive it soon. I took another hard look at the case. I'll flip it over. I'll flip it over. I lifted the Atashi case high up and flipped it upside down. But as soon, but as I was about to throw it, I heard a faint metallic sound. Quickly, I lowered the case again. I was certain the noise had come from inside. Once more, I opened the case again and looked inside. But still, I saw nothing of note. I tossed the medical equipment aside and slowly tilted the case from side to side. Although it looked empty, there was a distinct sound of something metal sliding back and forth. Hold on, C could it be? I tugged at the, at the case inner lining, quickly tearing it free. When I looked behind it, my eyes went wide. Thin layer of something that resembled white clay had been affixed inside the cover of a case. Several wires connected to connected it to a small electronic device. This was it. Oh, it really was inside the Itachi case. Here it is! I shouted to Kano. I found it! Kano hurried over, bringing his captive with him. There, Mr. Palmer. Take a look. When he saw what was inside the attache case, the fake Alfred went pale. No, it can't be. Alfred, why? His voice was hoarse with betrayal. Then abruptly, he broke into a stilted laughter. <laughs> Trusting someone really does make you blind. Such a simple, childish ruse. And it went right under my nose. The fake Alfred Palmer looked over at Kano. We need to get out of here immediately. He said. That right there is C4. 
a high-yield plastic explosive used by the military. And that's enough to blow this whole area to smithereens. Blow the whole area to smithereens? I picture Shibuya reduced to a blasted ruin. Meanwhile, Kano frantically begins searching the inside of the attache case. A microphone. Oh no, matter. Hey, detective, is that thing gonna explode or not? I tried, I tried, and failed to keep my voice from wavering. It looks like it's sound activated, but it hasn't gone off just from having people talking nearby. That means it must be set to explode in response to specific, specific sound trigger. Specific sound, huh? Now, now I understood Stanley's instructions. That's it. It must be Hitomi's ringtone. That's why Hitomi, that's why Stanley had me power her cell phone off. So that means we're safe then? Itomi asked. It's not going to explode anymore, right? Maybe, but wouldn't bet our lives on it. Kano continued his examination of the case. He carefully loosened the bomb and the cables, pulling them away from the lid of the case. The sight made my heart leap. And Kano went still shot and stock still, as if caught in a, in a hungry predator's gaze. It's not just a sound trigger. Voice detect detect. The detective's voice was a raspy whisper. The bomb has also been fitted with a countdown timer. I could see the timer now. It had been planted underneath the plastic explosive. My blood ran cold. Director Kuze, where's the bomb squad? While Kano made a desperate call to the police, I picked up the attache case and peered inside. Digital timer was steadily ticking down the seconds. I scanned the nearby area. There were too many people around to scramble. The Tommy was there. Too small was there. Several more of my old pals, along with a bunch of innocent bystanders. People are the lifeblood, I reminded myself. The blood that courses through the body was the city. Like cells, they brought to life the city I so loved. And I wanted to be. One of the red, or was it white, blood cells of Shibuya? Achi! Kano called out. Lead that thing and get out of here! No way! I sat down, cradling the cadence in my arms. Achi! What the hell are you doing?! I'm not going anywhere until everyone's made it to safety. Detective, you need to get these people to someplace safe right away. Clear the area first, then I'll go. But there's no way I can do that. Damn it! Don't you want to save these people too? I snapped. Kano bit his lower lip. They told me to wrap their arms around me from behind. Achi, don't do this. 
people that you need to get out of here too. Why? Why are you acting so crazy? This blood here words. I can feel her trembling against me. It doesn't matter. Just get as far away as you can. No. No, I'm not leaving you. After the day they spent together, they full well that telling you told me something once wasn't going to get rid of us. Governess was one of the one of the many things that was so amazing. This is the one favor I would ever ask of you. His voice, my voice came out of the soft and gentle. All right. Tito. Don't let me just say one thing first. There's still so many things I want to talk to you about. So much more that I want to know about you. So please, Hachi, don't you die on me. Don't worry. Once everyone's made it to safety, I'll clear out of here right away. Told me squeeze my hand and got up inside we heard it silently hurried away. Susumu! You and SOS! Start getting people out of the area! Yeah. Alright. Susumu turned away and spurt the gang into motion. <sighs> then for an instant, my eyes met Connor's. He gave a tiny nod. And look down at the timer. Get back! I shot at the top of my eyes. Everybody, get back! There's a bomb! I held the Atashi case tightly against myself as, the, as I continued shouting. I ran my voice raw, trying to warn the crowd away. Everyone get out of here! Just run! Following his lead, following my lead, Kano started directing nearby civilians to safety. There's a bomb! The detective shouted. Everybody run! Get away as fast as you can! Tusmu waved his arm emphatically. Please! He told me at it. You all have to get out of here! But the crowd didn't heed their warnings. At last, apparently deciding that the time was up, Kano t turned back to me. Achi, that's enough! Lead the bomb, and let's go! I could hear Susumu and Hitomi shouting as well. Susumu. There's no time left, man! Hitomi. Achi! Come on! 57, 56. The way Palmer had talked about the bomb. It sounded like it was a pretty dangerous one. It might be pretty powerful to block the entire intersection. And there were still so many people in your life. There was no chance they'd be able to get anyone to safety with a few dozen seconds that remain. I needed to minimize the force of the blast as much as possible. I 
cradled the bomb even more tightly to my chest, hurling over it. What are you doing? Come with us! Hurry! Screamed Connor. I don't know how powerful this bomb is, but please, God, let my body be enough to protect the people of Shibuya and protect Hitomi. I squeezed, my eyes tightly shut. I'm sorry, Susan. Looks like I won't be. Looks like I won't be able to keep visiting you in the hospital anymore. You'll forgive me, though, right? I stuck it through to the end, just like you told me. I didn't call it quits part way through. And so whatever you do, can't let that disease beat you. Don't you dare let that disease let that beat you. <sighs> I drew a deep breath as I finished my solitary little prayer. I couldn't have more than a few seconds left to go. I was glad that it was her voice that was the last thing I heard in this world and that I'll ever hear, or so I thought. Achi, bring the bomb over here! That wasn't my Tony's voice. I opened my eyes and saw Kano racing towards me, pushing some weird, weird piece of machinery. Hector flipped over, flipped open the machines, covered to reveal a huge amount of dry ice. Stick it in here! Flash freeze in the timer! Ought to stop it! I did as I was told, and shoving the attache case into the dry ice. Trying to help piling more of the dry ice on top of it. I hope that's enough! Trying to exclaim. He looked like a man desperate for a miracle. I could see the timer display through the gap in the frozen hydrogen still counting down. Is this not going to work? I and Connor held our breaths. 